سورة المباركة الفاتحة Just before we begin uh, I know there's going to be a competition at the end of the program for Muharram inshallah so a correction yesterday I said Ammar bin Yasser was uh, working under Abu Lahab in that he owned him it's actually Abu Jahal so thank you for correcting that Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad in Muhammad Muhammad the second point is <clears throat> just with this constantly happening that we ask people to get up and move forward if one hadith will make us want to sit near the minbar it is the following hadith of Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said to his companions when you are in the majlis of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam Allah encourage your children to sit next to the minbar as well as yourselves like children who come to their mother when she is giving them sweets and that is because nothing will be able to save us on the day of qiyamah like the minbar of Aba Abdullah al-Hussain alayhi salam Allah in that honor sallu ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad so inshallah do not shy away from coming close to the minbar be encouraged, race to be amongst the first people to come and sit next to the minbar of Abba Abdullah so that the lot and the favor of Allah will be yours, inshallah. Audhu billahi minash shaitan al ayn al rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa bihi nasta'in, thumma salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wal mursaleen. خاتم النبيين سيدنا وسيد الاولين والاخرين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد. وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتخبين المنتجبين المظلومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين الحجة بن الحسن أرواحنا له الفداء The loudest of our salawat على محمد وآل محمد we ask, we pray, we beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, to hasten the reappearance of the awaited hujjah and to bless us to be of those who will render him any service that the Imam needs to fulfill the world with peace, prosperity, and equality for all. To that end, we say, Salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Tonight, one of the requested topics from specifically our youth in the survey, those 15 and younger, have asked why do we need religion in the modern age? With all the scientific advancements and so on and so forth, why do we need religion? Inshallah, we will try to address the idea of religion in its necessity for mankind, first and foremost, but before we do that, we want to understand what is religion. Is religion simply a set number of rituals and practices which have been passed on from one generation to another generation and it becomes a cultural tendency and a cultural way of life? Number one. Number two, if religion is culture, and today we find that science answers many of the realities, then should not science become the culture which we follow because it brings about realities? And more importantly, number three, does religion encourage scientific knowledge or does it discourage us from scientific knowledge? And which, which religion or what is it that religion has done to separate knowledge from faith? And inshallah, by looking at these three points, we will be, or we hope that the respected listener will walk away having a better understanding of religion and the necessity of religion, not only in the modern age, but even in the ages to come. We begin with a salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, 
ma yudanu bihi al-mar deen religion is that which mankind borrow from we borrow from religion our beliefs in god we borrow from religion our beliefs in ourselves our purpose in life the purpose of creation we borrow from religion the social laws and the conducts which dictate on how we greet one another how we respect certain personalities and at certain times even to marginalize or to disassociate ourselves from certain cultural tendencies and ways of life so therefore in essence religion is a way of life that is borrowed from values that are more noble than ourselves this is what religion is in its linguistic context when we look for example at the religions which come from different parts of the world those religions which are not of the divine scriptures i.e they are not christianity they are not judaism and they are not of islam because these are the only three religions that have a claim and can prove to an extent at least through theology that their scriptures were not written by men but they were inspired by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can say that these are the three religions which have divine scriptures that the divine scriptures are still applicable today and they are still amongst us for example the torah is still present the psalms uh, the psalms of dawood are part of the torah so we still consider that as the one book the injil which is the bible we as muslims accept that its inspiration and revelation in its truest sense actually came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore we believe that it is a divine scripture and we have the Quran al-Kareem which was sent upon our most beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam these are the three religions which we call the religions of Tawheed they all call first and foremost above all else that they call for the unity in God that we believe there is only one God. What else we believe about that God differs. Does this one God have children? Does this one God marry? Does this one God require, you know, helpers and so on and so forth? This is now what we call aqidah. This is what we call theology and conviction in that one God. But essentially all three religions believe in this one God and these are known as the monotheistic faiths or the Abrahamic faiths that they all borrow their teachings from the Risala of Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi wa ala nabiyyina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam afdal salatu wa salam then there are other religions which do not believe in the unity of God for example we have Hinduism which although in essence believes in the unity of one God there is this idea that there are 99 different forms of this God and sometimes they don't work in harmony so there is the God of evil and then there is the God of good and if I wish evil upon somebody I go and give an offering to the God of evil in order to harm somebody else and if I wish to be protected then I go to the God of goodness or the God of war, or the God of charity, or the God of fertility. In essence, they believe it's the one God, but there is a contradiction in the aspects of this one God. And some people come forward and say, well, how is there 99 variations of this one God different to the 99 Asma al-Husna of Allah, which are to be found in Islam? The most simple difference is that we do not believe in any of the attributes of Allah the 99 names of Allah there is any contradiction in any of them it is the same Allah that we speak to it's not that there is a God of evil and a God of goodness it is the same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but we go to him through the different names in the different attributes that we may understand all of these attributes are in harmony and in sync 
Because he is al-Malik, he is the king, everything is under his realm. It is down for him to, or it is up to him whether he forgives, and therefore he is Rahman or Rahim, or whether he takes revenge from the tyrants on behalf of the oppressed, then he becomes the Jabbar. Or if he is just in his affairs with dealing with us, he becomes Al-Adl. But all these are in the realm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not going to a different God. We're going to the same God. So therefore, religion can come in two forms. Either you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the unified God, or you believe in other gods. That is the most basic breakdown in the tree of faith. Someone will turn around and say, well, what if I am an atheist? If I'm an atheist, I should be a third category. Islam says, no, if you are an atheist, you have a belief that there is no God. Therefore, you have a deen, you have a religion. Even though you may say that you are an atheist, it doesn't mean you don't have a religion. You don't have a God, but you do have a religion. Your religion is that there is no God. Because religion, again, as a word, it is a borrowed lifestyle. None of us here communicated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None of us received the revelation from Jibra'il alayhi salam Allah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, when we say Ad-Deen al-Muhammadi, that I follow the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, means that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived a certain lifestyle, preached a certain message. Me as a Muslim, I am borrowing from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we call Qabasan. I am taking a small portion from the light which he emitted to this world, and I live by that. Those who believe in evolution, they are not Darwin themselves, they borrow from his theory, therefore they are following a religion and a teaching of somebody else. Therefore even an atheist does have a religion. And since we understand that any kind of ideology or belief or lifestyle that we have as human beings, it means that religion will always be part of the human life. Just as water is part of a necessity that we have, food is a necessity, a way of life is necessary for mankind. That is because we live in a collective community. Nobody lives on a separate planet to everybody else. We all share this place that we call Earth. Therefore, there must be some laws, some conducts, and some agreement, verbal or otherwise, of how we should live amongst each other that everybody has certain rights protected for them. Islam is that religion above all other religions that did not just preach theology about the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam didn't just come to us and say there is heaven and hell and you must pray five times a day otherwise you're going to hell. If we look at the Quran al kareem Islam is a religion which teaches us that a woman has rights and it defines the exact rights of a woman. And it tells us that men equally have rights and it defines those rights. And it tells us that animals have rights and it tells us the trees have rights. And even in times of war, do not cut a branch of a tree because the tree is not going to war with you. And though you and I may have a dispute today, the generations to come may make some reconciliation between them. So leave this tree that they may benefit from it. Islam says there is a shared space. We live here for what? 40 years, 50 years, 100 years? Once we're gone, we don't take earth with us. Therefore, we must leave it in the same way that we found it. If not, then we must leave it in a better state than we have found it. So religion will always be an incumbent in the human realm so far as we are sharing a space and so far as we know that this space does not belong to us and therefore we must understand that religion is nothing but a set of rules, recommendations and a code of conduct. Does religion agree with science today or not? Because you see in universities they wish to disprove religion and disprove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through science, through the Big Bang theory, through whatever scientific evidence that they can present. 
And the narrative which has been presented is that somehow religion and science can never live in harmony. It's something like George W. Bush when he said, you are either with us or you are against us. You're either a Democrat or a Republican. You're either progressive and liberal or you are conservative and you want to take us backwards. This is the choices which have been given to us by mankind. But religion says to us that we should also look for realities. The basis of this idea that religion and science or scientific knowledge are in contradiction with one another is not something which Islam agrees with at all. And Islam wanted to do away with this idea from the very inception of it as a religion and a way of life. That is why from all the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have revealed to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, The first word of revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Rasulullah is Iqra, read. This is a religion of knowledge. This is a religion of reflection. This is a religion of contemplation. This is a religion which calls upon us to delve deeply into the sciences of the world that we may better understand the relationship between God and man and the relationship between man and the creation of God. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran Karim, Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan al Rajeem. And most certainly the scientists or those who are knowledgeable, Al Ulama, they are the ones who truly have taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the ones who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because through science they've come to a realization that all his words in the Quran are true. Number one. Number two, when we look at the Quran al Kareem, it doesn't say to us, go to the masjid. We're not like other religions that we just turn up to a temple or a church and there we find God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tell us in the Quran that we will find him in the masjid. Where does he tell us? Of course, the masjid is a place which is specifically designated for the remembrance and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the act of a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But from where does a believer gain his or her belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to become scientists. What does he say? A'udhu billahi min shaitan al rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim And look at the heavens how we have raised them. We look at the heavens, is that enough? No. Look at the heavens means go and study. Study how this heaven is raised without pillars. Science. Scientists discovered that there is a thing called the ozone layer. And that there is all these different elements which are in the atmosphere that allow the heavens to be the way they are. As a Muslim, if I go and I follow the Quran al kareem and I study and I contemplate about the heavens, I find that this is the wonder of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran al Karim says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And have they not considered how we created them from a clot? Or rather, the Quran al Karim gives it in the exact process. He said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And man was only a drop of semen. Not semen, a drop of semen. Then what else? Then they become an embryo. Then they become a clot. Then this clot, and the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he describes the clot, he describes it in as alaq, that it is a clot which clings onto something like a leech. And when we look scientifically today at the process of creation within the womb of a mother, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described it perfectly. Then we put bones, then flesh upon the bones, then they become full human, then you are born into the world, then you become a mature person, then you become elderly, and some of you shall pass before you reach all these stages. Allah says death can sometimes come before you fully mature as a human being. This is science. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look at the stars. Before there were no telescopes. Look at the stars. When one of them is extinguished, it looks like a rose, a red rose. We call that today a nebula. 
when we look at a star as it explodes, it actually looks like a red rose. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used science to prove his existence. Whereas scientists try to use science to disprove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fundamental flaw in an argument that I wish to use science to disprove God's existence is that science is never used in that respect. What do we mean by that? We have a terminology today known as forensic science. Forensic science is not used to disprove that somebody was here because forensics prove that somebody was here. Forensics does not disprove that a crime took place. Forensics proves that a crime took place. As a matter of fact, forensics can prove so much to us that we can even know at which time the crime took place and how it took place. Before we continue with that, I would like to ask the brothers to kindly step up and come forward, inshallah, with a salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Please come forward because there are some brothers standing outside who wish to enter. The second one in honor of Sahib al Asr wa Zaman, Ajalallah ta'ala faraj. The third in the honor of Sayyidatun Nisa al Alameen min al Awalin al Akhir. Please just come more forward, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa Alim. There is, uh, I actually, tomorrow inshallah we'll be looking at this particular surah in the Quran, but there is just on a side note here to digress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Mujadala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who believe, and if I can just have your attention for a moment, O you who believe, when it is told for you to make space in the majalis, make space. Allah shall make space for you in Jannah. And when you are told to stand up in the majlis, stand up, Allah will elevate your rank and status in your community. So with that, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So we come back to this idea that science cannot be used to disprove Allah's existence. Science is the forensic proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. How do we know this? If the Quran came after all the scientific revelations which we have today, then we say the Quran is playing catch up. But the Quran presented all these theologies and arguments and all else and actually encouraged us to go and seek scientific knowledge, had them accurately down to a point. There is an example in the Quran al Karim. At the beginning of the revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say to the believing men and women, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah does not do injustice mithqala dharra. Allah does not do justice to the equal of a dharra. Now, I won't say it's English terminology, which today we understand as an atom. In Arabic, dharra means atom. However, in those days, 1400 years ago, Bedouins, they haven't had any scientific advancement. They were just good at poetry and at oppressing one another. If we really want to know the state of the people of Islam before Islam, one only needs to read the khutbah of Sayyidat Nisa al alamin known as Khutbat Fadak. She tells them their state. She says, you are people who would drink water that even the animals were too dignified to drink it. Filthy water because they didn't have any desire for science. And she says to them that the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire and every empire that came and went didn't even bother to come here and conquer over you because they didn't see there is any benefit in you. Why would I want to conquer a desert where there is nothing there for me? Today is different. Today there is petrol under those deserts. That's why people want to conquer. But before, nobody wanted to conquer that part of the land. All of a sudden, Islam comes and it raises them to such a level that they become the thinkers. That people in the West come to the East to take knowledge, whereas today we leave the East to come to the West to collect knowledge, yes? And this is all thanks to those who became Khulafa when Allah did not make them Khulafa. When we look at this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah does not do injustice equal to a dharrah. 
for the people of that time, they believed that Dharra meant it is a derivative from Dhura, which is corn. That if we have this corn and it's got these seeds, that Allah doesn't do injustice even to the amount of a seed of corn. Because that was a small thing for them. So they were content with that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the tone. He says, Fatila. Allah will not do injustice equal to a Fatila. Now, what is a Fatila? And why did Allah change from Dara to Fatila? As in, is we have to understand from a logical point of view, Fatila must be something that is smaller than a Dara. Why? Because if someone comes up to me and says, you know, I feel that injustice has been done to me. Let's say, for example, they entrusted me with money. And they came one day and they said, you know, I think you're messing around. And I turn around and I say, Habibi, from all the thousands that you've given me, I've never even taken $10 for myself. So $10 is a small amount compared to the thousands. If this person comes back to me again and says, I feel that you still may be playing around, I don't say, Habibi, I haven't even cheated you in $100, because 100 is more than 10. I'm trying to emphasize that I will never do injustice to you. So now I must give an amount less than $10. Logically, rhetorically, doesn't make sense. So I don't increase the size, I have to decrease the size. Fatila in Arabic means when you have a string and you pull apart the threads of a string, it becomes a thin strip, uh, thread. The smallest component of a string, that thread is known as a fatila. In those days, the Arabs thought dharra is corn. Today we realize after the, you know, contributions of Einstein and the likes, that there is a thing called an atom. And in Arabic, we called it a dharra, the atom. But then we found that within this atom, there are electrons and there are so on and so forth. Clearly, I'm not a scientist. But within this atom, there are components that make it which are smaller. Now, with the advanced telescopes that we have, Scientists have discovered that even within the tiniest components of this atom's components, there is a tiny thing that looks like strings next to one another. Allah did not give us an example after Fatila. In Dharra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Dharra or less, whereas in Fatila, he doesn't give us anything less. And scientists today have agreed that this is the smallest thing in all of the creation. Allah was giving us that knowledge from then. Science has a, a discovered today. Therefore, this becomes forensic evidence of the existence of God, not forensic evidence that God does not exist. The idea that religion and faith or faith and science are contradicting to one another and are opposing to one another is something that unfortunately was born not through Christianity, but through the Roman Catholic Church. Notice the differentiation here. If we say Christianity encouraged the disconnect between faith and science, then we have become unjust and we are accusing Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus salam Allah, and his disciples that they had a hand in putting science and faith against each other. The Roman Catholic Church, and this is not we as in Muslims who are speaking, but this is the history which is taught in university. The Roman Catholic Church did not encourage people to read and write. There would be entire communities where the only person who could read and write would be a priest, the person in church. Therefore, making an entire community dependent on this individual. They couldn't even read the Bible, which is the way to God. Knowledge was discouraged. Science was discouraged. We find, and the name escapes me, but I believe it was Galileo, or Galileo, Ahsanta. That when he came forward and said, the sun is not, the earth is not the center of the universe. Rather, the earth orbits the sun. What happened to him? Imprisoned. And under duress had to come out and retract his statement. And history tells us that when he retracted his statement and he walked away, he said, but by God, 
the Earth does orbit around the Sun. See? When you are preaching a message that is based not on the teachings of Jesus, the Son of Mary, but based on maintaining the status quo of kings, then religion becomes victim to ignorance and humans by nature desire to know the words of Aristotle humans God made it inherent within us that we desire to know Rasulullah says seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave he didn't say pray five times a day from the cradle to the grave salah becomes incumbent upon us when we become baliq or when we understand what salah is Hajj becomes incumbent when it is affordable, but the seeking and the acquisition of knowledge for a Muslim and a Muslimah is incumbent at every stage of their life. Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. Someone will turn around and say, Ya Rasulullah, how do I seek knowledge from the cradle? Well, when you were born, you were Gugu Gaga, yes? Slowly, slowly, you begin to listen. Science today tells us that babies at the age of a few weeks or a few months actually begin to understand and begin to learn and begin to memorize. Before a baby speaks their first words, they memorize 4,000 words. They memorize 4,000 words. And scientifically, it has been proven that in a bilingual home, Babies no longer listen to words, but they look at the lips of their parents because they understand that there are two different languages spoken here. Therefore, simply hearing will not benefit me. I need to see who is saying what, and then I know that this is his language and that this is her language. This is the nature of insan, that even when nobody is able to teach us, we are able to teach ourselves. There is a story about a Bedouin who one day was walking and he saw someone praying and he said, who do you pray to? He said, I pray to Allahul Ahad. He said, I want to pray with you. He said, are you Muslim? He says, inshallah. He says, what do you mean inshallah? He says, I've never met a prophet. I've never received a message, but I do believe in the oneness of God. He said, how did you believe in God without a prophet coming to you? He said, I have camels. If one day I'm walking in this barren desert, and excuse the terminology, and I saw the droppings of a camel, I don't need to see the camel. I know that there was something which produced this. And I know that the camel had to have found pasture in which they ate from. And I know that rain brought down this pasture. And I know that the rain is ca carried by the clouds, and I know that the clouds evaporate from the sea. And I know that the wind must carry them. All these sciences that work in harmony can only be the creation of one individual, not two different individuals. Because I have also noticed that whenever two people disagree, corruption becomes manifest. And there is no corruption in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, I have come to believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, logically, even Einstein he said at the end, everything points towards one hand behind the creation. So therefore, science should never be a contradiction to faith. And faith should never be a contradiction to science. They must both work in harmony and in sync with one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran al-Kareem, in Surah Al-Imran, we look at the verse with the salawat ala Muhammadin wa alim. Beautiful, beautiful verse with beautiful, beautiful dua for every mu'min and mu'mina that we should reflect upon these verses. We begin with a verse 190 in Surah Al Imran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al rajim bismillah rahman rahim Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alteration of night and day, there are signs for those of understanding. Who are they? Look, first Allah mentions science. 
Then he comes to faith. In the creations of the heavens and the earth, and the alteration of day and night, there are signs for those of understanding. Where does their understanding take them? This is true knowledge. The true knowledge carries you to a new realm. Where does knowledge carry us? They are those who remember Allah while they are standing, and while they are sitting, and even when they lay on their sides, what do they do? They give thought to the creation of Allah. Look at the beautiful construction. They remember Allah while standing, while sitting, while laying down. How do they remember Allah? By having tafakkur. Yatafakkaruna fi khalqillah. A scientist, so long as they are thinking about the creation, they are a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Though they may not accept it now, they are on the journey towards God. Let us be honest with ourselves. How many of us have come to believe something today about God and Islam that maybe 10 years ago we didn't believe it? So then why do we rush onto other people and say, you are a kafir, you are an atheist, you're going to hell because right now this is what you think about Allah. Right now you don't wear hijab. Right now, you don't come to the majlis of Imam al Hussein. Therefore, you are a kafir, you are a mulhid, you are a muqassir fi ahlil bayt. Don't be too quick to judge. Because, in the same way that it took us time to reach where we have reached, this person is on a journey onto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, do not rush them and do not be the cause and the purpose that pushes them away from religion. Remember, people do not have a problem with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People have a problem with those extreme in religion. Ah, you dress this way, you cannot be a good Muslim. You do this, you cannot be a good person. So then they have this, what we call, you know, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The reaction of the people becomes that they say, why should I come to masjid? If all the time the uncles and the aunts are going to belittle me and make me feel low about myself. Why should I come to the masjid when people keep telling me that I'm the worst thing that's ever happened? Why should I come to masjid if I'm trying to learn something about Allah and Abu Abdullah al Hussein and Rasulullah? I'm, I'm taking baby steps towards God here. But as soon as I come, everybody thinks they're much better than me and they push me away. So now I feel like I have a problem with the masjid. I have a problem with the Imam Barga. I have a problem with God. But you don't. You have a problem with people. And that's always going to be the case. But see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that so long as they are in reflection on the signs of Allah, they are thinking about Allah. As the ayah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alladheena yathkuroon Allah, those who remember Allah, Qiyaman wa qu'uda wa ala junubihim While they stand, while they sit, while they lay on their side, how? Yatafakkaruna fi khalqi samawati wal ard. They reflect upon the creation of the heavens and the earth, therefore they are thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I said iPhone, everyone knows Steve Jobs. Yes? Because he's the creator of this phone. The creator of the heavens and the earth, when I'm thinking about his creation, inevitably I'm thinking about him. So long as I am thinking science, so long as I am in the pursuit of knowledge, I am in the pursuit of nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I may have not reached now, but inshallah I will reach tomorrow or the day after. When they reach a conclusion afterwards, once they have completed their reflection, what do they say? They say, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batilan subhanaka faqina adhaab al nar. Our Lord, we reflected on the heavens. We reflected on the earth. We reflected on what's between them. And we've come to a realization that you didn't create all of this as a toy. You weren't playing around. You created it for a purpose. Glory be to thee, save us from hellfire. They've come to a conclusion that there is a God and there is proof in God and now they know that they cannot disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they say save us from the hellfire then what do they say 
Our Lord, indeed, whomever you have admitted to the fire, you have disgraced them, and for the wrongdoers, there is no helpers. We've come to a realization that there is no other God who could have created this, so therefore there is no helper for us from you. And if we go into hell after all this knowledge and science and I get a PhD and in this world I was dignified and in the end I'm in hell, I have been disgraced. What good is my knowledge in the dunya if it ends in disgrace in the akhirah? True realization. As Allah says, surely the scientists, the thinkers, the scholars are the ones who fear Allah haqqa tuqatih. The way he ought to be feared. Our Lord, we have heard a caller calling on to faith. Saying, believe in your Lord, and we have believed. Our Lord, forgive us our sin, remove from us our misdeeds, and cause us to die amongst the righteous. When a person comes to the realization of Allah, they don't become arrogant, they don't go around speaking to people as if they are holier than thou. What do we say when we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? First thing, when I believe in Allah, I should ask Allah to forgive me all the times that I didn't believe in Him. I don't put an imam on my head and I go around with the haram police beating everybody. Be a Muslim, be a Muslim, be a... No. When you become a believer in Allah, first and foremost, ask forgiveness for your shortcomings. Don't look at the shortcomings of other people. A believer is the one, when we talk about hijab of men and women, inshallah, in the coming nights, a believer is the one who does not spend their time looking at the flaws of others. There is a personality whom Rasulullah said, I wish I would have met him. He's a personality from the days of Jahiliyyah, the days before Islam. His name is Hatim al tai Rasulullah said, I wish I could have met him. They said, why? He said, for his adab, for his etiquette. Hatim al tai was known for his generosity and he was known never to look at the flaws of others. In a poem of his, he says, what does it matter to me if my neighbor walks out of their house naked? For surely my eyes never saw. Even if I saw someone do something wrong, I don't go around saying, ah, see the other guy, he was walking in the streets naked. Oh my God, we need to do something about it. No. He says, I didn't see. I'm not going to be the one who starts the conversation about somebody else. If the conversation is brought up, that's a different story. This is the akhlaq of a Muslim. That when I see flaws in other people, I say, I never saw it. I saw two people talking. I don't go around and saying, oh, I think there's something going on there. They must be doing haram. How do we know? We shouldn't. Again, scientifically, we become better Muslims. Through knowledge, through reflection, we become better Muslims. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, an hour of reflection is more dear and beloved to God than 70 years of ignorant worship. Allah didn't want us to be headbangers, just smash your head on the floor, sujood. Up, smash your head on the floor, sujood. Oh, now I'm going to heaven. No. This is not making mockery of salah, mind you. It is just to say, do not make salah ritualistic. Amir al Mu'mineen wa Imam al Muttaqeen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. <laughs> He says, how many people stand long hours in Salah and the only thing that they attain from Salah is that they get knee pain. Their joints begin to ache. And how many people fast many a day but all that they attain from fasting is the pains of hunger. And how many people recite the Quran with beautiful verse, voices while the Quran is cursing them for they do not act upon it. Religion is not rituals. Just like science, there is the theory and then there is the practicality. I have a theory that if I mix co content A and content B, something will happen. I can't leave it as a theory and expect the world to take it. No, I must go out and put the theory into practice. I believe that Islam is a religion that gives charity to others, then practice the charity. I believe Islam is a religion of forgiveness, forgive others. I believe Islam is a religion that tells me not to look at the flaws of people, don't look at the flaws of the people. I believe Islam is a religion which asks me to be good unto my parents, be good unto thy parents. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran al-Kareem, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu 
آمنو او یو هو کلیم تو بلیف ان گاد بلیف ان گاد اند بلیف از اکشن صلو علی محمد و علی محمد What happens when we call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah we'll come to a conclusion here فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبَّهُمْ When you're a scientist when you're knowledgeable you have a special position with God when you call upon him he responds to you if you can just close that door and salawat ala muhammadin wa ala muhammad What does he say subhanahu wa ta'ala? He says, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبَّهُمْ أَنِّي لَا أُضَيُّ عَمَلَ عَامِلٍ مِنْكُمْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى I shall never let your efforts, men or women, go to waste. Beautiful here is that Allah included women amongst the scientists. Those people who say that Islam says a woman should be at the kitchen, Those people who make jokes and say God gave her small feet so she can stand closer to the sink. Or maybe God gave her small feet so she can stand closer to the scientific equipment, the apparatus, maybe. Right? This is ridiculousness in that we think a woman is somehow subservient or lesser than a man. As if a different God created her or as if God created her just for my entertainment and your entertainment. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, I have responded to your prayers. And I have concluded that I shall not waste any of your good deeds, men or women. Then what does he say? بَعْضُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْضُ For surely some of you can support the other. Meaning here, men and women should work collectively to have a better realization and understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially in this day and age when hijab is constantly under attack. When I say hijab is under attack, it's not hijab, it's Islam that is under attack. But again, it is so much easier to notice a woman in hijab than a man, right? When hijab is under attack, we shouldn't be those kind of people who say, ah, oh, you know, I don't want my daughter to go to school because maybe this, that, the other. Look, if you teach your children to run away from a problem before you've given them the opportunity to face that problem, you have taught them to become cowards for the remainder of their lives. I cannot understand the brothers and sisters who say, inshallah, when I have a child, I won't name them Muhammad or Zainab or Ali because people will bully them in school. Let them get bullied in school. They will learn to stand for themselves if you teach them that Zainab stood up for herself, that Ali stood up for himself. Teach them, don't just give them a name. Teach them what that name is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I shall not waste your efforts. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes this ayah in the following. What does he say? So as for those who leave, hajaru. Let's read it in English, it's better. So as for those who have immigrated or were evicted from their homes or were harmed in the cause or were made to fight or be killed in my way, I will surely remove from them all their sins and cause them to admit them to enter gardens from which heavenly rivers flow. Allah concludes the ayah in that science will always be faced with difficulties. As a scientist, even in the university academic circles, whenever you present a new theory, it will always be met with something. Not everybody will accept it right away. And therefore, sometimes when we say science here, I'm making it interchangeable with Islam because Islam is science. Likewise, in Islam, you may not be welcomed wherever you go. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those of you who have to immigrate, leave. Yesterday we talked about immigrating. And those of you who are forcefully removed, and those of you who are made to fight or they are killed, don't worry about that. I shall replace you and compensate you with heavens where you will be appreciated. We have some narrations that say the reason why Allah made heaven a place of eternity is because science is never ending and the true mu'min will never stop seeking knowledge. Therefore, in Jannah, we have an eternity to try every experiment in life that we may be able to better understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this conclusion, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yes, you will suffer as Muslims, as believers, as thinkers, 
a scientist. But don't give up at the first hurdle because your suffering will bring about a better reward in the next life. In the same way that Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah al Hussein had to suffer on the plains of Karbala, at that moment in time, there was no immediate reward for Imam al Hussein. Today, 1400 years later, the name of Hussein alayhi salam Allah is mentioned in every part of the world. And Yazid Lanatullah alayhi and those who killed Imam al Hussein are cursed by not only the Muslimin but whomever comes across the story of Imam al Hussein. He is in Jannah while his enemies are in hell. My brothers and sisters, and I would like us to seriously reflect. Tonight is a night in which we remember Muslim ibn Aqeel. When we as Muslims are mistreated in the West because of our names, or because we wear hijab, or because we ask for an extra five minute break during afternoons that we may pray Dhuhr and Asr, the oppression which we face should be a badge of honor for us. Insofar as we are ambassadors to an Imam. And as long as we are rejected and we are oppressed, it is an indicator that the world is not ready for the Imam. And therefore in our oppression we say to our Imam, O oh Imam, though we wish that you hasten towards us, the world is not ready for you. Imam al Hussein salam Allah, sent Muslim ibn Aqil as an ambassador, as an emissary to the people of Kufa who sent letters to Imam al Hussein in their thousands, in the tens of thousands. Some narrations say 140,000 letters signed and sent to Imam al Hussein. Some say 70,000. Whatever the number may be, it is an a huge amount of letters sent to Imam al Hussein. Each letter is no different to our dua when we say, Allahumma kulli waliyika al hujjat ibn al Hassan. That is a letter to the Imam, come, we are ready to give you bay'ah. When Imam al Hussein received these letters, the first thing that he did is he sent a letter back to them saying, I am sending to you my brother and my cousin. He calls him his brother before he admits that he is his cousin. In the same way that Rasulullah spoke about Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Akhi wabna ammi. My brother first and foremost, then my cousin. My brother in that he is equal to me in my faith. My cousin biologically, but in Iman, in Taqwa, he is my brother. What does Imam Hussein alayhi salam Allah then say to them? I have favored him and chose him for you over myself. Meaning Imam al Hussein was in dire need of people like Muslim ibn Aqil. But instead he sent him forward. He said, I'm giving him to you people that you may benefit from him. If you are truthful that you desire me to come to you and you will be obedient and helpful to me in establishing peace and prosperity, then treat him well. For how you treat him will indicate how you will treat me. When people mistreat us as Muslims, it means they are not ready for the Hujjah ibn al Hassan. And therefore, in our suffering, we should take a page from Muslim ibn Aqil who did not run away and said, maybe I should stop praying, or maybe I should change my name from Muslim to Mo. No, he remained steadfast so that in his life, whatever sacrifices he can make, his sacrifices will be a warning and an indicator to the Imam about the state of affair of the people. And there was Muslim ibn Aqil alone in Kufa. One moment, 40,000 people pray behind him in Masjid Kufa. 
And before he could conclude Salat al-Maghrib, he looks behind him and only 10 people remained. By the time he walks to the door of the masjid, only three people remained. And by the time he comes to the gates of Kufa, no one was around him. Gharib, alone, estranged. Those who claimed to be lovers of the Rasul and the religion of Rasul abandoned him. And those who were the enemies of Allah were hunting the streets for him. Muslim alayhi salam Allah for three days and three nights did not rest in any one place, constantly on the move. Because nobody was willing to give him shelter. In those days, where do you go when you need food and water? You knock at the house of people. But Muslim was so considerate that he may bring trouble to people, he didn't even knock on the door of anyone. He sat on the street outside a home. A woman, elderly, opens the door. She says to him, O oh son, I am a widow and there are no men in the house and you look like to be a Muslim man and a noble man and you understand that culturally it is not befitting for you to sit at my door for people may think ill of us. Be on your way. He says to her, could I at least ask you for a drink of water? For I have been three days without a drink. She offers him the water. He drinks. He remembers Abba Abdullah al Hussein. She goes, returns later on. She says, you are still here. Leave. Go to your home. Go to your family. He says to her, I am a gharib. I have no friends and no family. From where do you come? I am from the tribe of Bani Hasha. From which house? I am the son of Aqib. Welcome, welcome, O oh Aqib. She brings him into the home, but she has a son-in-law who is greedy for wealth, and he goes and he tells the people that Muslim is in the house. Within a few moments, there is a hustle and bustle outside. Muslim dawns his armor, puts out his sword, he looks at Tawa and he says, I wish I can repay you for your generosity and hospitality. But as you see, I am marching on towards an inevitable death. Insha'Allah, in the next life, your reward shall be given to you. Yes, as Muslim goes out, they begin to attack him from one side and the other side, from the roofs and from the alleyways until he was outnumbered. Bi Abi wa Ummi. They take him towards the La'een ibn La'een ibn Ziyad who orders that Muslim be taken atop the tower of Kufa and there he tells them you will execute Muslim and throw his body off the tower. <coughs> Before they execute Muslim alayhi salam, the executor says to him, O oh Muslim, do you have any final requests? He says, yes, I would like to offer two units of prayers just like Salat al-Fajr for Allah knows how much I love Salat Muslim alayhi salam prays and his prayer is so slow that when he finished the executor looked at him and said are you so afraid of death that you prolong your Salat to delay death Muslim turned around and said to him by Allah that is the fastest salah I have ever offered in my life. For I am eager to return unto Allah and be in the company of Rasulullah and Amir al Mu'mineen and Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen and Al Hassan al Mujtaba. Yes, as Muslim is about to be executed, he turns his face towards Medina Rasulullah. What does he call out? Assalamu alaykum ya Aba Abdullah. 
This is the final farewell. I wish that you would not come on to Kufa. The people have betrayed me and most certainly they will betray you. Yes, ya mu'mineen. The narrations say that as Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was marching from Medina towards Kufa, when the heard when he heard the nida of Muslim ibn Aqil alayhi salam Allah, he turned to Abu Fadl al Abbas and he said to him, Oh Abbas, tell them to camp here for the night and bring to me all the women of my household and bring all the sons of Bani Hashim and then bring to me Hamida, the three year old daughter of Muslim ibn Aqil. And Abbas doesn't know what is happening at this moment. So all the Ahlul Bayt gather and Hamida walks into the Khaimah of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Imam al Hussein picks her up, he places the three year old child on his lap, he puts his hand on her head, he smiles in her face, he says, Oh Hamida, these my sisters, they are your mothers, these are my daughters, they are your sisters, here are my brothers, take them as your uncle and take me like you would take your father. She looked up to him and said, Abba Abdullah, has something happened to my father? For I have seen you treat the orphans in this way. What has happened to my father Aqil? He says, Allahu lakil ajr. Yes, your father Aqil has been shaheed, but Abba Abdullah, on Yawm Ashura, there is a three year old child by the name of Sakina alayhi salam. When you were getting onto the horse, what did she do? She came out and threw herself at the feet of Dhul Janah. Imam Hussein says to Dhul Janah, Dhul Janah, let us go on to the battle. But Dhul Janah would not move, lowering his head as if to say, Ya Aba Abdullah, look down for a moment. When Imam Al Hussein looked down, he saw the three year old Sakina holding gone, saying, Dhul Janah, do not rush too quickly with my father. Aba Abdullah Al Hussein descends. He looks at Sakina. He says to her, Sakina, you know that this is going to happen. She says, Baba, I do not want you to remain. I know that this will happen, but I want you to do one thing for me. He said to her, what would you like? She said, treat me how you treated the daughter of Muslim ibn Aqil. For after you leave me, I will be orphan and no one will show me kindness. And I heard that I will be slapped by Shimr al